Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this online information session for the PhD DBA program in Values Driven Leadership. My name is Amber Johnson. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the Center for Values Driven Leadership and also a student in Cohort 4, and so I'm doubly excited to welcome you here today. This is our last online information session of 2018, and I know if you're like me, we're all just trying to make it through to a little uh, break time over the holidays. And so we want to honor your time today by getting started right away. Um, and to do that, as we get started here, I just want to set a couple of housekeeping rules for us as we proceed. First of all, as you are well aware, we're using the WebEx software to facilitate this call. And if you are not familiar with it, um, it would be helpful if you would get familiar with two different aspects of it. One is the mute button. And you can see the mute button on the right-hand side um, next to your name. It looks like a little microphone with a line through it. Uh, and if you can just help me keep you muted, that'll cut down on background noise as we're um, listening to each other today and give everybody else a really good listening experience. I'll also try to keep you muted, but if we have any complications with it, just help me out with that, please. And the second thing I'd like you to familiarize yourself with is the chat function. You can look for a little icon that looks um, like the little thought bubble that you see circled there on the screen. And you can click that button and then select my name, Amber Johnson, at any point during the call to ask a question about the PhD program. So please use that to send me your questions. I'll collect all of those. And in about 15 minutes, we'll start answering those questions. And that's actually how we'll spend the bulk of our time today. So please do take time to send me your questions using that chat function and again, address it to Amber Johnson. And uh, when we get to that section of our call, I will um, make sure that your question gets addressed. All right, well, to get us started, um, let me tell you what today's agenda will be. In just a minute, I will introduce you to Jim Ludema, the director of our program, and he'll introduce you to the panelists on our call today, as well as to the program overall, and he'll spend some time just sharing some basic details about what you can expect as part of the program. And then we've invited one of our current students to be on the call today, and she'll spend some time telling you about her experience. And then we'll spend the last 30 minutes or so just answering your questions about the program. So again, start now by sending those questions to me using the chat box. Uh, one final comment before I turn it over to Jim. We just want you to join with us in celebrating that this year we were named the number one PhD program in leadership by HR.com for the second year in a row. And we're really excited about that. And in particular, we're excited because we think it reflects the hard work of the students and the faculty in our program, students like Selva, who's on the call with us today, as well as Jim, our, one of our professors and the director of our program. And beyond that, we also have hopes of staying on this list for years to come and making it an exceptional program. And we hope you'll want to be a part of that. So with that, I'm going to turn the call over to Jim Ludema, who's the director and co-founder of the Center for Values Driven Leadership. Jim is a professor of global leadership and a recognized expert in the topic of workplace culture. He earned his PhD from Case Western Reserve University, and he's been teaching executive students here at Benedictine University for about 20 years. He's a leader in the study of appreciative inquiry, which is a leadership and organizational change model that you may hear some about today. And he's also the author of the text, The Appreciative Inquiry Summit, as well as many journal articles on that topic and other topics. So with that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Amber, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being on this uh, online open house today. I want to get started by introducing our team at the Center for Values Driven Leadership. And as you can see on the slide, there are three core faculty members in addition to me, none of which are on the call today. They are Marie Di Virgilio, Gus Gustafson, and Mike Manning. And there's one core staff member on the call, and that's Amber Johnson, whom you've already met. And as I'm sure you have experienced, she is exceptional. She's our chief communications officer and a senior research associate and is in charge of our marketing, communications, recruiting, and thought leadership dissemination. And as she mentioned, she's also a student in the PhD program, a member of cohort four. And today she'll be leading the webinar and moderating the Q&A session. A little bit more on Selwa Rahim Dillard, our distinguished student that we have on the line today. 
Selwa is the Senior Manager of Diversity and Inclusion Strategies and Planning at U.S. Cellular Corporation, where she helps design and implement transformative and business-relevant diversity and inclusion strategies that build competence, increase engagement, and improve employee performance. Formerly, she was the president and CEO of an award-winning mortgage brokerage company that focused their fair lending, focused on fair lending for blacks, Latinos, veterans, and women. Selwa earned her master's in human performance and training from Governor State University, where she was named a distinguished scholar, and she earned her undergraduate degree from DePaul University and has completed executive education courses at Dartmouth. Selwa is an outstanding member of Cohort 4, where she is nearing the completion of her coursework, and she's already working towards her dissertation research, which focuses on how to build great inclusive organizations. She's got some very rich data, and I'm certain that the results of her research are going to be very high impact. So also tell, uh, tells me today that she's suffering from a bit of a cold. So she says that she's going to sound a little congested, but she's here soldiering through. And so well, we appreciate you being here. Now I'd like to introduce um, the Center for Values Driven Leadership. And as you can see on the slide, we exist to help values-driven leaders develop themselves and others, build flourishing companies, and transform business and society. And values-driven leadership is really all about doing business the right way. It's about being clear and confident about your own core values and then building values-based organizational cultures that promote flourishing at every level. And we're talking about values like honesty and integrity, care and compassion for people, excellence and accountability, and meaning, purpose, and contribution to the greater good. And so fundamentally, our purpose at the Center for Values Driven Leadership is to change the way business is done by studying values driven companies, telling their stories, and developing their leaders. Practically speaking, we focus on three things, research, education, and practice. On the research side, we as faculty, staff, and students are engaged in a bunch of projects, most of them focused in some way on the link between culture, values, and performance. For example, Amber is focusing her dissertation on success factors in leading global change. What leads to successful outcomes when you have to lead across multiple countries, cultures, environments, time zones, currencies, value systems, and so on? And of course, Selwa is looking at best practices for building inclusive organizations and how active strategies for inclusion can drive superior performance. We've also, as a center, been engaged in the Return on Values project in which we are partnering with the small giants community who are a bunch of values-driven entrepreneurs and the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan to study the link between organizational culture and profit. We've done deep dive case studies with a number of high-growth values-driven companies to find out how they do it. How do they leverage their culture and their values to drive long-term sustainable growth? How do they hire and fire? How do they attract top talent? How do they develop people, recognize and reward, innovate and grow, manage their money, and so on? Essentially, we are unpacking the DNA of great values-driven companies. On the education side, we have the PhD DBA program, and we've also developed a master's program in values-driven leadership that we are offering to companies in a variety of customized degree and non-degree executive education formats. 
In terms of practice, we offer consulting services and customized executive education programs to companies. And we also offer a senior executive roundtable each year where we open our doors and invite 100 or so leaders from the business community to come and spend a Friday afternoon with our faculty and our doctoral students, along with a couple leadership gurus that we bring into town to explore a hot topic of interest, like emotional intelligence or leading change or building inclusive organizations or working with millennials and so on. So that's a bit of an introduction to the Center for Values Driven Leadership overall, and now I'd like to focus specifically on the PhD DBA program and highlight five key points. First, the program is for senior leaders who want to change the world through business, and this is based on the idea that business is currently the most powerful institution on the planet and the institution with the greatest potential to influence positive change. So we're looking for people who share this conviction and want to be a part of a great learning community that will help them advance their life and their career in that direction, all from a values-driven perspective. Second, the program is for people who just love to learn, and it's different from any other doctoral program out there, whether it's a traditional program, an executive program, or an online program. Ours is designed to help you grow as a leader, to help you grow as a scholar, and to help you grow as a person. And we provide a safe and inviting space in which you can sort of find your edges and push your edges and open yourself to personal and professional transformation. And what we found is that the students who thrive most in our program are those who open themselves to the world of ideas and jump in with both feet and explore as many theories and models and perspectives and experiences as possible and then engage in deep, meaningful learning with the others in the room. Third, it's a scholar practitioner program, and that means that the faculty and the visiting scholars bring their best, most cutting edge ideas into the classroom. And the students do the same. And then together, we build new theory, do new research, and test them in the world of practice. So in this program, you become a creator of new knowledge. You're not just a consumer of knowledge the way you would be in an undergrad or master's program. You're a creator of new knowledge, a creator of new ideas and new models, new approaches that you and others can apply in your organizations and also write up and publish to advance the state of the art of the field. Fourth, the program is a student-centric program tailored to the demands of executives working full-time. It's designed to be completed in three years compared to five to seven years for most doctoral programs. To accommodate those who commute in from out of town, classes are held once a month on weekends plus an annual eight-day intensive so you can be in class on the weekend and still put in a full week of work. You can select one of two tracks, a more research-focused Ph.D. degree or a more practice-oriented DBA degree. All of the coursework is scheduled to help you make progress toward your dissertation beginning day one in the program. And you can focus your dissertation on pretty much any topic you wish within the fields of leadership, sustainability, and strategic change, broadly defined. You'll get an unusually high level of faculty, staff, alumni, and fellow student support because we're a community of learners fully committed to your success. And you get to do all of this in our brand new state-of-the-art building, the Goodwin Hall of Business, which is a great space for learning. Fifth, we work hard to make the program a truly global learning community. We bring in as much diversity into the student body as possible, and much of the teaching in the program is done by visiting scholars from leading universities around the globe. 
We also engage in global exchanges in which students and faculty travel to different parts of the world, such as Belgium, Dubai, France, India, Ireland, Italy, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Spain, the UK, to engage in high quality learning exchanges with top scholars and executives from other countries and cultures. For cohort five, the cohort for which we will hope you will apply, we're working to further solidify the scholar-practitioner connection. In the past, we've held two leadership lecture series weekends each year. But going forward, we'll host one of those weekends each year and use the other lecture series weekend for faculty and staff to attend the leading conferences of our field, the Academy of Management Conference and the International Leadership Association Conference. In year one of the program, you'll attend the Academy of Management Conference in August, and in year two, you'll attend the International Leadership Association Conference in October. Both of these conferences are phenomenal opportunities to meet with leading thinkers in the field, explore cutting edge research topics that you're passionate about, and present your own research and case studies and get feedback. We've made this change to the curriculum after observing that students who attend conferences learn more, advance more rapidly in their understanding of the field, make valuable connections with leading scholars in their areas of interest, and make better, faster progress on their dissertations. Plus, traveling to the conferences as a cohort is a lot of fun, so we're really looking forward to that new approach. Also in Cohort 5, we'll connect you with one of the world's best writing coaches, Joanna Beth Tweedy, to help you get comfortable with academic writing. We know that a lot of successful practitioners, perhaps you included, are a bit nervous about their ability to write at the PhD or DBA level. And there's nobody better than Joanna Beth Tweedy to help you grow in that regard. She is an exceptional writer, a professor of English literature at Western Governors University, and a graduate of our cohort one. So she knows how to help you tailor your writing specifically to our program because she's been through it. So just to summarize about the PhD DBA program, we're looking for senior leaders who just love to learn and grow and develop and who want to change the world through a values-driven approach to business, and we hope that you are one of those leaders. And now to give you a little more perspective on the program, I want to turn it over to our panelist, Selwa Rahim Dillard. Selwa, take it away. Wow. Thank you, Jim. Can you hear me good? You bet. Very good. So this is very humbling. I remember a few years ago being on the other end of one of these webinars, listening and just dreaming of this opportunity. And to, to now be here four months from our last class, it's such a blessing. Um, so two things I'd like to just share quickly that I think is that makes this such a signature program is one, the cohort experience, and two, the scholar practitioner model where we get distinguished visiting scholars. So when I think about the cohort experience, all of us come in as practitioners. We have a passion for leadership, and we all have a desire to change the world through business. But many of us have different specific areas of interest, focus, and expertise. It is through this rich cohort experience that I have been able to build a community of learning. Just as we were on this phone, two of my cohort members were asking me about different IRB, the Institutional Review Board process. Um, we become family. We engage in rich, rigorous discussions that challenge our beliefs, that help build our scholarship. We learn new models and theories through each other. We experiment. So some of the things that I think are pertinent in my field, they know that now. And so if they read something, they'll shoot it to me. So I'm, I have all of these people who are also helping to now build my scholarship. It's a very supportive, curious, and loving environment. And we're having a great time 
becoming scholars together. The other thing that I think is phenomenal about the program is the scholar practitioner model with the visiting scholars. So as a practitioner, I always read Harvard Business Review, and I thought that I really understood what it took in order to be um, excellent in my field. However, this program has expanded my understanding of the theoretical framework that anchors much of what I do. I learn now from the leading scholars. So many of the scholars who visit, they've actually written the books that we're reading so we can ask the, the, the foremost authority all the questions we want. I have a great friend who is also in a doctoral program, and we were reading the same book, but the difference was that scholar who wrote the book was in my program. She couldn't believe it. I was able to ask some of her questions to that scholar because now you have the exchanging of ideas and the rich dialogue that you can only get in a program that is designed specifically like this. One of the first courses that I actually took in the program introduced me to a model. I'm a diversity and inclusion practitioner, and the inclusion model was created by um, a very well-respected scholar, Lynn Shore. I was able to take that inclusion model, take it back to the workplace, use it for many of the things that we've designed within my company, and roll it out entire, to our entire uh, footprint in America, just from that class alone. And I was so impressed by that scholar, I was able at one of the conferences, the AOM, to meet her, to build a relationship with her, and now she's on my dissertation committee. So it's unbelievable the amount of opportunity that you would get from a program like this. Um, and I want to be respectful of time. I think that's it. So I'll turn it back over to you now, Jim. Great, Selwa. Thanks a lot. And I think I need to turn it over to you, Amber, for the Q&A session. That's great. Thank you both for giving us that introduction. And, and Selwa, I would agree with you 100% that it's the Distinguished Visiting Scholars that really, for me, that was the, what sealed the deal on entering this program as compared to all the others. And um, that's a great example of the powerful experience you can have with them. Yeah. We are ready to start our Q&A. Thank you. And um, I've been receiving questions to people from people, but uh, we have time for more than what we have already. So please take a minute here and find the chat function in the WebEx software and type a note to me, Amber Johnson, and just ask your question. And I will make sure we cover it as the call proceeds. Um, but we do have some questions to get us started. So Jim, I'm going to turn the first one over to you. And um, that is, would you just explain a little more the difference between the PhD and the DBA? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in my earlier comments, the PhD is a more research-focused degree and the DBA is a more practitioner-focused degree. But the practical difference in terms of how you go through the program is quite slight. You take the first two years of coursework together, whether you're in the DBA or the PhD track. It's when you get to that third year of the program when you're working on your dissertation that there's a difference. In the PhD track, you do a scholarly dissertation using traditional research methods, quantitative or qualitative or both. And your goal is to contribute to the literature in the field through your dissertation research. In the DBA track, you do some kind of project or intervention in your organization or in your community. It could be a leadership development initiative. It could be an organizational change initiative or whatever the case may be. And then you write up a real robust case study of that and lessons learned, linking it to the literature but not necessarily contributing to the literature in the same way you do with a PhD uh, degree. Also in the DBA track, you don't necessarily have to use traditional research methods like qualitative and quantitative research methods. And so the PhD is a bit more uh, scholarly uh, uh, oriented towards contributing to the literature and the DBA is a bit more practitioner oriented focused on contributing to your organization in some way through uh, a project and then writing up the results of that project and lessons learned. You don't have to make the choice as to which track you uh, final, finally go into until the end of the second year of the program. So you have plenty of time during the program to 
you know, try different things out and uh, see what you're most comfortable with and then make your choice towards the end of the second year. Great. Thanks, Jim. That, I think, is really clear. So uh, the next question is for you, and I think it's the question that everyone's wondering, even though only a few people have asked it, and that is just, you know, what is the workload like in this program? How much time does it take you? How do you, do you fit it in, and can you really work full-time and do this program? Wow. So, um, yes, you can, and the workload, I think, is, um, I would say we would, we spend maybe average of three to four hours a week, would you say, Amber, reading and working? Sometimes it could be more depending on the um, on the workload for that class. However, I have I've shared with others how I negotiated with my company that the weekend that I have class, that Friday I take off and I spend a lot of time reading and just prepping for the weekend. It's definitely manageable, but that's one of the biggest things that I've had, that I have opportunity with, is just managing life, work, school. But yes, it's definitely manageable. Great. And I, you know, just from my own perspective and, um, you know, working for the center, we always survey our cohorts to ask them how many hours they spend each week in study for the program. And and by study, I mean uh, the reading that Selwa mentioned, as well as um, writing any papers that you might need to write, working with um, fellow classmates on presentations, thinking ahead about your dissertation, all of that combined. And it tends to be an average around 15 to 20 hours a week overall, that total package. Um, and that varies a lot by student. It also varies a lot by um, by what class you're in. Earlier in the program, you know, you might be easing in. There might be some courses that have a different sort of workload. But it is it is fairly demanding. And those of us that are managing full time careers and maybe young families or or whatever it is, it does definitely take um, some sacrifice in terms of how to divide up your time. I'm sure Selma would agree with me on that. I've seen how hard she works. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Jim, a question for you now. Uh, someone has asked about the master's requirement that we have in our program. Can you clarify if a master's is absolutely required, or could you potentially earn a master's on your way to your PhD? Um, uh, you don't earn a master's on your way to the PhD. Um, that's not part of the program. But um, we do accept from time to time uh, people into the program without a master's degree. Um, our, our, um, I think that all of our literature says a master's degree preferred, um, and just about everybody who comes into the program does have a master's degree, but we have brought people into the program who do not have a master's degree but have significant uh, experience and significant training and executive education uh, experiences that they've been through. Um, and then in our interview with them, we feel like they have got what it takes to succeed in a doctoral program and uh, they're the right kind of candidate. So um, we're open in that regard in terms of uh, who we take into the program. Thanks, Jim. And, and a kind of related question to that, um, another requirement of the program, as we say, is, is that it's a program designed for senior executives. What would you say to people who are working towards that level but haven't yet been um, positioned to a senior management position? We're open to considering those applications as well. As I mentioned earlier, we like to bring in um, as much diversity as possible into the cohort body. Uh, the program is definitely primarily for uh, senior executives in business, but we always I have a couple of folks who may not yet be in those senior positions but look like very uh, high potential folks and um, people that we would like to invest in and help uh, them succeed and achieve their goals. We also bring in a, uh, always a couple of people from nonprofit organizations, a couple of people from the military, a couple of people from healthcare. So we, it's not just business leaders because we find that that diversity of, of uh, experience, that diversity of uh, sector um, adds to richness of the dialogue and the learning in the classroom. Great. Thank you for addressing that, Jim. 
Selwa, a question for you uh, for a lot of um, people on this call. Perhaps it's been a while since we've been in a classroom, and uh, we're just wondering what that looks like these days. What does a class weekend look like in terms of how you're spending that time together in class and what's involved there? Yeah. So um, it's very much a warm, inviting, uh, curious incubator. So uh, Friday evenings we start at uh, 6.30 and we go throughout the evening. Most times after class we may meet because we have teamwork, so we spend some time with our groups, perhaps go to dinner. The next morning we're there bright and early. We spend the entire day from like 9 to 4 that Saturday um, where we're having a lot of dialogue as groups and teams and individually engaging with the scholars. That evening we usually spend time together again after class. And so I live in Illinois, but when it's class weekend, I come and I stay at the hotel with everyone else so that I can fully engage in the cohort experience because there's so much learning that happens in and out of the class where we're able to then challenge and ask questions about the different things that we're reading and really going deeper. And so that has been one of the huge blessings of the cohort experience, and we carry that out from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I I know you kind of hit on this, but I know someone was also asking about the hours, so let me just state it clearly. On Friday, it's um, 6.30 in the evening until 9.30 at night, and, you know, usually there people do a variety of things. Some people who are from out of town fly in on Thursday night so they can work a full day from their hotel room. Other people fly in early in the afternoon. And then um, Saturday and Sunday, classes are 9 to 4. And that's one weekend a month. And then once a year in the summer in June, we do um, eight straight days of classes. We call it the eight-day intensive. And that knocks out two courses at one time. And so those days are a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, and you do have that, of course, as Jim said, for the first two years of the program. And then in the third year of the program, you're working on your dissertation and don't uh, have to come to campus except to meet with your dissertation chair. I just wanted to make sure I answered that very clearly for the people that were asking. Jim, a, a new question for you. Uh, Benedictine, of course, is a Catholic university. Can you just talk about how um, religion is or isn't present in the program? Uh, yeah, Be uh, uh, Benedictine University is a Catholic institution, but the Center for Values Driven Leadership is not um, uh, uh, focused on any one particular re religion or um, set of uh, values and beliefs in that regard. We really are a center dedicated to welcoming people from all faiths or people who profess no particular faith. And we have students in the program who are Catholic Christians, Protestant Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, and folks who, as I say, profess no particular faith, and they're all welcome. And we encourage the dialogue between all of those different groups in terms of how to build great values-driven companies and develop great values-driven leaders. And so that's really an important part of our center, that uh, openness to all perspectives. Now, Benedictine University, being a Catholic institution, is very resonant with um, the work that we do and us being a values-driven uh, leadership center. And so we get a lot of support from the university. Um, but um, we're not, um, you know, dogmatic in one, one way or another in that regard. Great. Thanks, Jim. So, uh, you know, Jim mentioned earlier that this is um, part of the program's purpose is to help you make the transition from being a practitioner to being a scholar practitioner. But uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how it's helping you just as a practitioner in general? Is it contributing to your work? Can you use anything you learn on Monday morning? Absolutely. There have been so many instances. Um, one in particular is uh, we had a scholar by the name of Ron Fry come in who he is well known for uh, things with appreciative inquiry. And so we were reading some of the things uh, that for that course, and one of the things came up is a process called Grippy Goals, Roles, Processes, and Interpersonals. And so we had very, very rich dialogue about change and resistance to change and how to uh, really get the best out of people. And that Monday, I was able to apply goals, 
the grippy model. I had done it in the past, but I did not understand some of the theoretical underpinnings for it and why it was so important. And I was able to ask very dis distinct questions about the process to Ron Fry. And so that week, I literally was able to implore what we had talked about all weekend long. And so I think it's that's just one of many examples where I was able to really see the, the benefits of my education immediately. Hmm. That's a really tangible example. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I, and I can say too, like, um, it's been impactful for me in the same way. And I hear the same stories from our classmates and, um, and the other alumni of the program. And one that I'm thinking of in particular is Lee Murphy, who was a student in the first cohort and who, um, uh, he owns a small business, a small company that's focused on helping, it's part of the healthcare space, they help people who are overcoming uh, multiple chronic diagnoses. And as part of the program, he, uh, he saw that there was maybe a different way of doing business. And so he actually used his dissertation to rethink his business model and apply that appreciative inquiry process that you were just mentioning, Zoa, and um, really helped uh, change the direction of his organization so that they could help people thrive and as a result the business is thriving now too so there's some really big practical implications of it as well yes jim uh, a question for you um three years is you know some if, if you go to a traditional phd program it could take you three full years just to do your dissertation so how are we helping people get through a dissertation process plus coursework in three years. What does that really look like leading up to the dissertation? And then maybe while you're talking about that, you could just share a couple of um, topic areas, you know, and kind of help people see the breadth of topics that are covered in our dissertation. Yeah, sure. So in my uh, original comments, I mentioned that we um, uh, in, invite students to begin working on their dissertation day one in the program. And we've got the program structured to make that possible. And one of the things that we often say is trust the process. We've got it built into the process to help you make progress on your dissertation beginning day one. And uh, what I mean by that is even when people apply to the program, we ask them in their application to write about what they might want to do their dissertation on, so they're thinking about that already. Then um, in, the, in the curriculum, you do the first year of coursework is um, content areas. Uh, you know, we've got a course on leading self, a course on leading teams, moral and ethical foundations of leadership, org theory, and, and others, where you're learning a lot of the content. But during that first year, we also have two weekends where we ask students to think about what their dissertation might be, put together a presentation, and come to class ready to present on that to get feedback from other students and from faculty. So that helps students, um, again, make make incremental progress each of those weekends. In addition, in the first year, we have an assignment called Qual 1. It's a qualifying paper. And in that qualifying paper, you go out into the top 15 journals in the field, go back three years, and see what people are writing about. What are the hot topics? Who are the authors that you're most attracted to? What are the methods that they're using? What, are they, what kinds of studies are they doing to help you get familiar, get so, socialized into the literature in the fields of leadership, strategic change, and corporate sustainability and responsibility? So in that sort of um, uh, that call one process, you're, you're getting, you're homing in on topics that you're interested in for your dissertation. So that helps you move along. Then in the second year, we all have a second qualifying paper called the Qual Two. And that's where you do a very deep dive into a topic that's of interest to you. So, for example, uh, Selwa is interested um, in inclusive leadership. And so she's reading everything that's been written on inclusion, inclusive leadership, inclusive organizations, and so on. Amber's interested in global leadership and global change. So she's reading everything that's been written around global leadership and change strategies on the global scale. And you do a deep dive literature review uh, of a topic that you're interested in. Also in that second year, we're continuing to have these weekends where we ask students to, again, come back in, present updates on, you know, what your dissertation topic is, how you want to study it, what you're thinking to get feedback from others. Also, as we mentioned, built into the curriculum are these visits to these conferences, the Academy of Management Conference, the International Leadership Association Conference, and other conferences internationally um, as part of the program. And at those conferences, you can present 
uh, on what your dissertation topic is and get feedback from the world's leading scholars um, in the area that you're interested in. So all of those things are sort of building muscle and building refinement uh, around the dissertation topic during the first uh, year, year and a half of the program. And then towards the end of the second year, we get into the research methods courses qualitative and quantitative research methods, and there you begin to say, okay, how do I want to do my dissertation study? Do I want to use qualitative or quantitative or both? And so you're um, putting together your thinking around your methods. And so by the time you get to the end of the second year, the end of the coursework, you've already got your dissertation topic selected, you've already done a deep literature review on that topic, you've already got your methods in place, essentially you've got the first three chapters of your dissertation written in a draft form. You pull together your dissertation committee and then you're uh, you know, ready to go um, sort of shooting out of the gate into that third year mm -hmm. to collect your data, analyze it, and write it up. So the whole process is designed to help you make progress on your dissertation from day one. In terms of topics that you uh, that people are doing, I mentioned a couple uh, already, but there is real breadth in the program. Um, you know, John Heiser, for example, in cohort two, did his dissertation on how to position a company. He was a COO of a company, is now CEO of a company, and how to, posi how to bring together corporate social responsibility goals and performance goals uh, so that they mutually reinforce each other and how to build strategies for uh, doing that, creating shared value. Um, uh, Lee Reamer, another student, uh, was a person who was transitioning out of the military and wanting to go into the private sector. And he did his dissertation on successful mid-career transitions. And what do those look like? And he interviewed a bunch of people who had made those transitions, transitions successfully and did a dissertation on that and developed a program that he now uh, offers uh, to people to help them make those same mid-career uh, transitions. Um, you know, Tina Husing did her dissertation on global leadership, sort of in the same area that you're working on, Amber, and she, what she did is she replicated a famous study by Henry Mintzberg, who followed five senior executives around for a week each to find out what they actually do, and she did that with five global leaders. She followed five global leaders around a week each to find out what they actually do and did her t dissertation on what Global, the nature of global leaders work. So there's a wide variety of topics that people choose. And what our goal is in the program is to help each student find that passion so that when they do their dissertation, it's contributing to their career, it's contributing to their life goals, and they have passion and energy to work on it rather than forcing them to work on my research agenda or Mike Manning's research agenda. We really try to help the student find their passion and do a dissertation that will help them advance their career and personal goals. That was great, Jim. Thank you. And I'm going to ask a related question for you um, because you talked about, you know, people's career goals. Where do people go after the program? When they finish, what happens next? for most people in terms of their careers? Yeah, I would say about 60% of our graduates stay in business, stay in industry, stay in their organizations. Um, you know, maybe they move to a new organization, uh, get a promotion, whatever the quick case may be, but they stay in business, stay in industry in some capacity. Maybe another 20%, uh, 25% go into some kind of, uh, they transition out of business and into some combination of teaching at the university level and consulting. You know, they start a consulting company and, and do part-time teaching. Uh, a lot of students do that and actually use the program as a leverage point to make that transition. Uh, and then I'd say about 20% of our students, uh, maybe 15%, I'm not sure exactly the percentage, go into full-time academia. We've got uh, graduates teaching at University of Virginia, University of Auckland in New Zealand, um, Xavier University, and a bunch of others. And so some of them go into full-time teaching, teaching in leadership programs, running leadership programs, uh, and so on. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I have uh, one final question for you, Selwa, and this is a tricky one, are you guys? so I hope you're ready. Uh, it's a personal one. How are you a better leader because of having been in this program? How are you a better leader because of having been in this program? Hmm. <laughs> so I would say, um, or I've been told, because I think my leadership is best described from the perspectives of my team as opposed to self, uh, I've been told that my ability to facilitate and be neutral has um, improved drastically. Uh, so this program has taught me all the different types of leadership, um, servant leadership, and uh, you learn about different theories. And I've been studying inclusive leadership and how I can be more inclusive. And so my ability to, even when I think things should be a certain way, I now have more understanding of the, the relationship that I need to build with the people on my team in order to make certain that they are optimally performing and that they see the best in me and that I'm always looking for the best in them. So this, it's given me different ways of pulling out my toolbox, a way to – basically my toolbox has gotten bigger. And so I've been able to apply those things and being a more facilitative leader that allows people to gradually learn from their own um, mistakes as opposed to me pointing things out. Are you doing that with your kids, too? Because I find that to be the hardest. <laughs> I didn't say that, Amber. <laughs> I'm still a helicopter mom, but in the <laughs> workplace, it's definitely uh, allowed me to be more facilitative. Great. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. You know, Amber, just, I, oh, may, may I pitch in on that a little bit? Because I think Selwa's being uh, a little bit humble, which is not uncharacteristic of uh, Selwa. Um, but the other thing that I've noticed uh, with you, Selwa, is that you are now a thought leader in your space of inclusive leadership and building inclusive organizations. And the, I think what you said to me one day is like, you know, you, for, for years you've been practicing stuff, um, and it's worked in many in you know many ways. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, obviously, but in many ways it works. But now you're able to connect it to the deeper research and actually see, mm -hmm. provide evidence around which strategies do work and which strategies don't and why. And that has helped to really deepen your own practice and then also position you as a thought leader in, your, in the field. With well, other companies. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Bet. That's awesome. All right. One last question for you, Jim, before we move into just some housekeeping details. And the question is just, you know, this is cohort five of the program. So what does the future hold for the program and for the Center for Values Driven Leadership? How do you, how do you want it to grow and change? Yeah. It, it, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm very excited about the future. I mean, the the quality of the PhD DBO, DBA program just continues to grow, and I think that that is evidenced by, you know, receiving the uh, award as the best uh, PhD program in leadership in the country two years running, and we just want to continue to, um, you know, grow that excellence. We also want to um, continue to expand our impact, so we want to continue to grow our research initiatives. Uh, get funding for uh, uh, our research initiatives as we have in the past, continue to do that so that it has an impact on other business schools and on the literature. Um, we want to continue to grow our master's program. You know, the PhD program, the DBA program, it's a great program, but it's limited in terms of the number of people who are willing to make that kind of financial and that kind of time commitment or who are interested in doctoral level work. And so we're very excited about the master's program that we just developed and getting that into companies in customized formats and also be uh, offering it as an open enrollment program so that, you know, thousands of um, managers, leaders at every level can uh, be connected with a values-driven approach uh, to business. So that's a, a big part of what we want to do as well, continue to grow that and continue to grow our consulting and custom solutions for companies again so that, uh, we can have a, a greater impact on how business is done, um, you know, here in the U.S. and elsewhere. That's awesome. And I would also add we have a, a vision of um, in late 2019 or early 2020 hosting the first academic conference on values-driven leadership, which, you know, the students who would be coming into Cohort 5 would have a chance to be a part of as well. So another way to extend 
the impact in the world. And um, yeah, and, and people on the call could have a chance to be a part of that. Absolutely. That's going to be great. Yeah. All right. Well, we do want to honor your time today. So let me just uh, begin to wrap us up with a couple of announcements, and these are really important. Um, we are now accepting applications, and it's, it's time, if you are interested, that you apply. In fact, the, the deadline was November 1st, and we will continue to accept applications until the cohort is full, which we think could happen in the next few weeks. And so if you are interested in cohort five, which begins on April 4th, then here is what I strongly recommend. Between now and Thursday, go online and complete the online application. And I'll send an email to everybody on this call just so you have access to that. That online application takes about 30 minutes to complete. And then over the next two weeks, go ahead and finish the other parts of the application process. You know, your essay, your transcripts, requesting letters of reference, things like that. Once we have that online application in the door, we won't close the application period without reaching out to you first. So that's guaranteeing you a chance to have your application considered and then it gives you time to get the other pieces in. So that's what I would strongly recommend. I also wanna note that the university is closed for the holidays between December 24th and January 1st. So so we will try to be responsive to emails, but if you have questions, this, is, this week is a really good time to reach out to me in particular, and I'd be happy to get on the phone one-on-one -on -one with any of you to discuss the program further. Um, as you can probably tell, Selwa and Jim and I, as well as many of our other students and our faculty, our graduates are really passionate about this program, and so we're eager to tell you more about it um, and would be happy to talk. And you can reach out to me. I'm sure you all have my email if you want to schedule a time to do that. All right, I also wanna make sure you found this page of our website, um, it's our website slash doctorate. And each of the orange sections on this page are links you can click to get to more information. If you want to look at, you wanna read actual dissertations, you want to view some of our mini videos, you have, um, you want to explore the curriculum and read summaries of each of the classes or um, consider who's in the program and read more about the bios of our students, including Selwa, you can find it all here. And then, of course, that lower right-hand corner, that's where the application, uh, link to the application and our checklist that will walk you through the process can be found as well. So we definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, and we also encourage you to check out this program booklet available at the link you see there on the screen. You can see Selwa on the cover of it. Um, this is downloadable, great for your iPad if you're traveling over the long holiday weekend. This is a great resource for you because you can download it to your tablet and it's got all the information in a single document. So we encourage you to do that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim for some closing comments. Well, thanks, Amber. And thanks everyone for being a part of the webinar. I just wanna, sort of summarize that we're really looking for a dynamic group of senior leaders who want to change the world through a values-driven approach to business, who love to learn and want to grow and develop as leaders, scholars, and people, who want to push the frontiers of the field both in theory and in practice, and who want to be a part of a global learning community full of like-minded, smart, fun, values-driven leaders like Selwa and Amber. So thank you all for being here, and thank you, Selwa, and thank you, Amber, for your participation in the webinar. And with that, I believe we are adjourned. Everybody have a great day and a wonderful holiday season. So long. You too, Jim. Thank you. Bye, everybody.